On the other side of Silicon Valley, what, what was happening with Sam Altman, who is the CEO of OpenAI, and they fired him on Friday. They were going to bring him back on Sunday. There's a lot of drama. I decided to do a full case study and break it into three parts for you. The history of OpenAI and what brought us to the weekend from hell we just went through and the winners and losers and what's next. So I've got that all set up for you. It's going to be a, a very detailed case study this week. So let's go over to Studio B, find my board and do it. And I'm going to see if I can unlock your brain, just like you can unlock your brain with a vault. This is black cherry. You can also get watermelon, cucumber, mint. Go on Amazon, get yourself a case and see if it doesn't unlock your brain. Right now, let's see if we can unlock our brain with a deep dive into open AI. All right, I found my board. I'm back here. Man, I love that black cherry flavor. All right, I'm going to take you through a dive now. We're going to go through OpenAI, three parts. First, I'm going to take you through the history. And then we're going to take you through what was in the headlines, the weekend from hell, and see if we can fill in some of the blanks that maybe you didn't see in those articles. And then third is, who are the winners and losers, and what's the epitaph? Because we're all using AI. We're talking about putting it in products. What's important? So we start with the history of OpenAI. Well, we've all heard about OpenAI. Most of us uh, have heard of it. A lot of us just think of ChatGPT. So where did that all start? OpenAI is the organization that did it. Quick little history. So where it began. First of all, you have to look back to its origins and who was involved. It was really a nonprofit, and it was in December 2015 that a whole group of people, you know, Ilya Sutskever, Greg Brockman, Trevor Blackwell, all the folks that you see here rolling off, put this together. And Sam Altman and Elon Musk were serving as initial board members, and they all had this simple mission, artificial intelligence is a way that benefits humanity as a whole, and we're going to advance it in a way that benefits humanity. But back in the day, they were thinking about building things, less worried about security, but they did have these Orwellian thoughts into the future that says, hey, there needs to be a watchdog, something over this, because these are deep thinkers looking into our future. Now, so from 2015 to 2019, from their founding, they would announce tools, little mini products, and partners. First of all, this was big. Elon Musk and all these folks together here, including AWS, Peter Thiel, InfoSix, and YC Research, which is Y Combinator Research, which is what Sam Altman was leading, leading Y Combinator. They pledged over a billion dollars to get this thing going off the ground. Because remember, there's some of the founders are on here, but not all of them. This is the group that announced the funding of a $1 billion pledge to the nonprofit that's going to bring AI to you and me and control it and monitor it and do good things. Well, <clears throat> only about $130 million only was collected, but they put that to good use. 2017, they released Universe. That was a platform to basically get, provide reporting measurements and to train AIs. Then they went to um, 2018, and then we had the first of what would be many resignations from the board. Musk resigns, not out of any drama or anything. There may have been some drama behind the scenes, but there certainly wasn't publicly. He simply said, listen, I'm going to do Tesla self-driving, and I have an AI project going here. I don't want people to think these are commingled or anything, so I'm going to step off the board and at that time that would be the last uh, dollar that Elon Musk would put into this he would make no further donations and remember it was a nonprofit so these were referred to in those days as donations to the nonprofit to help it go and do these things well then they announced this little very cool thing they showed dactyl and dactyl was this thing that could um, AI that could mimic the movements of human hands and it actually showed it how it solved a Rubik's Cube. So now they've got things out there the same way, but now this machine learning and things that are going on here, this is pretty interesting, 2018. 2019, something very big would happen. Now we're only about four years into this. We've had some tools, we got some money, about $130 million, things are going on. And they say, we're now going to go to a for-profit structure. 
And I'll show you the structure in just a minute. It's a little bit of a complicated structure because you can do anything in corporate structure. You can have holding companies that own holding companies that own companies at the end. And sometimes these are done for insurance or inheritance to your kids, trusts. There's a lot of reasons. Liability, you know, you're, you're, you're making explosive chemicals over here and you want to make sure there's three levels before it gets to you so they couldn't take your personal wealth if something happened to a company making explosive chemicals. Well, nonetheless, there was a structure that was adopted here that was a little unusual, and we'll look at that in just a minute. But nonetheless, it was going to a for-profit entity. They wanted a for-profit entity because they said, look, we need to raise big money for this, and we need to incent some great talent. If we have great talent, we want to give them equity, but you can't give them equity in a nonprofit. So on the surface, it looks like a very reasonable thing. How can we continue the mission of this nonprofit, but have a for-profit entity somehow with board governance so that we could issue this equity and, and do certain other things? Okay, on with it. Well, along with that came with Microsoft announces a partnership and a billion dollar investment commitment. Okay, now we're talking. They go from a billion dollar pledge where only 130 shows up to a billion dollars. And Microsoft says, just put it on the card. Here you go. Away we go. Well, now, something interesting happened at this point. And I want to go through a statement that was made by Elon Musk, who left the board in 18. And in 19, after it became for profit, Elon Musk says, I'm kind of concerned. I'm kind of disappointed. I'm going to read this to you. He said, look, the reason OpenAI exists at all is because I used to be really close friends with Larry Page and stay at his house in Palo Alto. We would talk late in the night about AI safety, and my, Elon's, impression was that Larry wasn't taking AI safety seriously enough. He really seemed just focused on achieving digital superintelligence, essentially a digital god, if you will, as soon as possible. This is not good. Then, he, so I thought, this is Elon still, what is the furthest thing from Google, which would be a fully open nonprofit because they're a fully closed profit. And uh, so the open in AI stands for open source and transparency so people know what's going on. I'm normally in favor of for-profit companies, but the idea was not to be a profit maximizing demon from hell that never stops. So that's why open AI was founded. Very unfortunately, they decided to be a for-profit company. And there you have it. So this is the structure of that. Now let me take you through it. We start out with the board of directors, of which there was nine of them. And this is OpenAI Incorporated, a 501c3 charity nonprofit. Well, now they want to be able to issue equity to employees, and they also want to be able to do some other things here. And so they create a holding company for OpenAI nonprofit and employees and investors. The majority, they were the majority open of Open AI Global, a capped for-profit company. That it was a for-profit company that the profits would be capped, I think, at you know, 10x or 100x or something of total investment. There were some controls there. Then employees and investors would own this company, but look at the control. The board controls this, which owns this, but the board opens and owns and controls. OpenAI GP, which controls this, which controls this. So you can see how the board control worked. And here's my Microsoft, a minority owner, with that kind of money, a minority owner, 49%, they said. And you can see how it comes together. So what started out as a board of directors and a nonprofit through this um, chart of controls and ownership here, which was provided by OpenAI, thank you guys very much. This is the definition of the, not the definition, this is the blueprint of what they put together on paper so that the board of the nonprofit would still control the board of the profit and they could issue stock options to employees. So unusual organization. So now, 2019 to 2020, here comes GPT, chat GPT. Well, we know it as GPT, but it stands for Generative Pre-Trained Transformer. Basically, where you could ask questions and it'll give you a, a language response. So away we go. 
and its big capable language model that had about a billion parameters that it could work with. Interestingly enough, you know, a year later they announced GPT-3 and they announced that 175 million parameters. So you can see the speed of development. Remember, more parameters is basically more data, more ability to scrape, interpret, so that the, the engine and the artificial intelligence here gets even smarter. And away we go. Now then, momentum really starts building. In 2021, they announced DAL-E, you know, or a deep learning tool. This tool you could take natural language descriptions, like you're describing a mountain, a sky, and it could create a picture for you thinking about considering what you just said in natural language, which was pretty cool, pretty cool thing. It just shows you what's happening with that billion dollars from Microsoft as they continue to run it. Then they announced an expanded partnership with Microsoft that valued the for-profit side at about, at about $14 billion. Pretty amazing. Then this is where it all exploded for you and me. Because a lot of this, if you were not a geek in Silicon Valley or not paying attention to these things, you really didn't see it like live. All of a sudden it's on the news and everywhere as they announced ChatGPT based on GPT 3.5 for a free preview. And that's when you started seeing people do, hey, I just asked it a question about M&Ms and it was right. You know, how many M&Ms have been sold in the history of the world? Approximately 17 trillion. You know, remember people were asking silly questions, but asking good questions. And then these people came up, what if my kid is using term papers like that? I don't like that. And so all there was this pluses and minuses of the benefits that were being received from it, but also the danger of it was uh, not really danger, but with the risks and the downsides and the unintended consequences were also very, very prevalent. And they had a million signups in like five days. Remember, you would go into ChatGPT, oh, it's off the air, it'll be back in a minute. And then you would come back later, they have more bandwidth and stuff. And that was a teething pain. It was far more successful in a free preview than they ever thought it would be. Then, January of 2023, they announced they're going to be raising more money at like a $29 billion valuation. And the current investors, I've repeated them there for you, Peter Thiel, Reid Hoffman, Microsoft, Kosla, Infosys, Thrive Capital, Tiger Global. There was a bunch of people that were in this by now. And away we go. February, Microsoft says, you know what? We're going even bigger. We're going with a $10 billion multi-year investment. And the rumors were out there, because they didn't announce these details straight up, yeah, Microsoft's going to get about 75% of the profits, and the maximum they will own is 49%, because they don't want regulatory uh, um, uh, folks to drop in and say, do you own too much of the IT infrastructure of these United States? So they're like, hey, we don't want that review. We don't want to go through that. The maximum we will own is 49%. Then they announced ChatGPT Plus, a $20 a month subscription now that you could get, and it keeps going. And then they announced GPT-4 with an API, an improved API, because they had issued APIs in the past, and put that in as a feature on ChatGPT Plus. November, they temporarily put ChatGPT desks on a wait list because the demand was so great and they're making a bunch of money at $20 a month. All these millions of users are coming in there that pay 20 bucks a month so that they could have this you know, available with the advanced features and the API and whatnot. So the momentum was crazy. Everything is going on. It looks on the surface like this is really successful company, and it is. Now, two camps emerge along the way. People that have a safety bias, meaning leaning towards safety, but they want the company to succeed, they like what they're doing, they're putting things out there commercially, and Ilya Sutskever, certain board members and others wanted an intentional approach to safety that was measured and thoughtful pace. So they were in favor of commercial, they just wanted safety to be above commercial as these wonderful products are being brought out there. Then you had the people that had a more commercialization bias. In other words, safety was part of their, I mean, they cared about safety as well, but their bias was toward commercialization, speed of development, staying ahead of competitors. And there was a lot of competitors emerging in AI. And now that you're a for-profit with a billion from Microsoft, previously 10 billion committed over the next several years, now you have to stay ahead of them. So, We've got a target on our back. We've got to stay ahead. We've got to drive it. So it was a little bit more manic startup pace. See the difference? 
it's not that they did safety bias side didn't want to sell it they did they just wanted a safety bias and the commercialization people they they weren't like hey the hell was safety they were just driving like a startup because of so much was happening in the space and in the background people were you know becoming capitalists let me explain open ai had engaged thrive capital you know, to architect an, you know, an offer, and I'm reading this to you, that allowed employees to sell some of their shares. Because remember, they're recruiting employees now for the last few years. This is 2023. So now, 2019 is where they went for profit, and 2020 apparently was about the time they were issuing um, uh, options to people. Well, guess what? Now these people are like, hey, this thing is worth a lot of money. Maybe I want to sell some of my shares. And so Thrive Capital was putting together private purchases. What's a private purchase? A private purchase where a venture capital firm comes up and say, look, I think you're going to be really valuable in the future. What if I just bought some of your people's shares from them at today's market price? That way I get a piece of the company and we don't have to do a financing round. So away they go. And that's what was going on. And Thrive Capital was the architect of that. SoftBank and others wanted to be part of that, but they were told, no, no, why don't you wait to the next round of private sales? So in the background of all this, you also had a successful company on capitalization with some employees that wanted to take some chips off the table, as we say, and monetize some of their shares. So these camps are emerging. And also some things with Sam being a fellow that can be distracted, have many projects. I don't know if you call it distracted, maybe I shouldn't use that word, but he was working on many projects and he had stepped away from Y Combinator, the most successful accelerator in the history of mankind. And the reasons that were part of it was he had a lot of projects. He was working on open AI for crying out loud and other things. And just maybe he's not able to put a whole lot of time and effort into Y Combinator. So he stepped away from Y Combinator. And similar things, or as whispers starting to say, he, maybe he's got a lot of things going on here. Why do I mention this? Because right about here, November, we then go to the weekend from hell, which is just what happened here, the weekend from November 17th to 20th, 2023. What happened? November 17th on Friday, Sam Altman is fired on a board call you know, with Sutskever and the board and Greg Brockman, a good friend of his who was president, wasn't there. He was told he's no longer on the board, but he was still president. And Mira Murati was named interim CEO. So Sam's like, wait a minute. And they say, listen, communication has broken down. We don't think you've been forthright with us. You're done here. That really took Sam by surprise. Well, it took a lot of other people by surprise too. So Elia apparently had made appeal to the board about what was going on, and he had won over at least Helen Toner and maybe others. But the board was only down to about four people at this point, minus Sam and Greg Brockman. And I'll go into that in a minute. So they said, you weren't consistently candid in your communications with us, with things are going on, you know, and, you know, we have a difference of opinion on safety, speed of development, but they would later say, and I'll show you in a second, that safety was not part of the decision. It was failing to be forthright. Okay, well, we'll go with that. And at this time, Altman side ventures, you know, were kind of straining things. For instance, supposedly he was working on a chip product that was codenamed Tigris, and he had been over to the Middle East speaking to big money, such as the Saudi PIF fund, um, about to raise money to make an AI focused chip manufacturer that would actually compete with NVIDIA. Wow, so he had, that's a big project. That's not just a little, hey, I'm writing a book on the side or something, that's a pretty big project. But supposedly all this is what you know, led to them you know, uh, letting him go, but they really hang it on. He wasn't candid with this, there was a breakdown in communication. So it was a very busy Saturday. Now it's late Friday, he's been dismissed. Uh, Greg Brockman and says, I'm off the board, but I'm president. Sorry, I'm out. I resign. And here we go. He's gone. Then three lead scientists, researchers, they said, we're with Greg. We're resigning. So all of a sudden, you know, open AI is in free fall. This was handled poorly, handled suddenly. And they also forgot to do something. They forgot to call Microsoft because 
Satya Nadella of Microsoft, the CEO, you know, almost $13 billion into OpenAI. He says, damn it, I am completely blindsided here. And he supposedly was very upset and was saying on Saturday, I want him reinstated. Step back, let's unwind this. I want him reinstated. Also, Saturday, Altman and Brogman said, well, if they don't want us here, we already have ideas. And they spent a day discussing next efforts and other people reaching out to them saying, Sam, I'm with you. Whatever you want to do, I'm following you. So this is the only words, and I've said it a minute ago, is free fall. Open AI was in free fall on Saturday. What's, what's going on? Then no less than Vino you know, Kosla of, of Kosla Ventures, and they were investor in open AI. He says, look, I want Sam back, but I'll back him in whatever he does next. So this is somebody coming up saying, hey, whatever happens, I'm with Sam. So basically, Kosla is saying, look, I'm an investor in open AI. I'm with Sam. Simple as that. You know, I want him back in and I'm here and I'm an investor here. Oh, going to be gone? Going to be over here? Well, then I'm in whatever he, he gets into. So all of a sudden, all the allies of Sam are running around. And this led to OpenAI finally makes a statement from Brad Lightcap. And Brad Lightcap supposedly went around inside um, OpenAI. AI, and he was trying to talk to the board and talk to others. And what he, the way this statement is presented was that Brad was out there trying to get some sort of truth and then bring it, bring it out. And so he says, we can say definitively that the board's decision was not made in response to malfeasance or anything related to our financial, business, safety, or security privacy practices. This was a breakdown in communication between Sam and the board. So they're drawing a line there that said, yeah, we spent most of the summer arguing over safety. Ilya and Sam were going back and forth. Uh, Sam did some presentations, you know, to a couple places, and we were concerned about that. We're concerned about commercialization without, you know, more measured approach to safety. They admitted that was going on, but they're backing away from it and saying, no, there's a breakdown of, of communications. Sam wasn't completely forthright. Okay, then what happens? So now, some, Saturday was a, a mess. And by the way, this is a case study on how not to do it. On Sunday, what happens? Altman comes to the OpenAI offices and everyone is saying he's negotiating his return. Microsoft has spoken, Kosla has spoken. There's a bunch of allies. A bunch of people are saying, we're leaving OpenAI. You know, Greg, the president has left. So now the board is like, okay, let's all get together and go over there. You know, an Altman post on X makes a uh, picture of him with a guest bag. So I hope it's the first and last time I ever wear this, meaning, to everyone that was watching, I guess that means he's negotiating, he's gonna come back. Well, some little news bits leaked during the day. They said that he was acting, you know what, maybe I return, maybe I don't. He was ambivalent about it. He also made it clear to a lot of his allies who then were leaking to the press, intentionally, unintentionally, who knows. He said, if Altman comes back in, he, he wants there to be a new board and a new governance structure because obviously, how do you trust these people? Even if you liked them before, you like working with them, what just happened, trust is broken in many ways. And so, nope, I'm gonna need a new board. Seems reasonable. Then Musk comes out late on Sunday and defends Sutskever in a post on X. I am very worried. Elia has a good moral compass and does not seek power. He would not take such drastic action unless he felt it was absolutely necessary. What is he saying? Obviously, he knows he would not take such drastic action. It confirms that Elia Sutseeker went to the board, got at least Helen to agree with him, and away we went. But the internet loves a conspiracy about what's really happening, and it would get one. So late Sunday evening, the leak is that Altman will not return at all, and that Emmett Shear, who is the founder of Twitch, will be the interim CEO. So that happened on the East Coast where I was at about 12.15 um, a.m. I get a text alert. I think the information popped it out first or whatever it was, but that's where I got it that quickly. And I texted with a couple of friends in Silicon Valley and they were like, yeah, that's, that's what we're all hearing. So that's, that's Sunday. Then more happens Monday morning. OpenAI confirms the Sunday night rum rumors. Altman's not returning. And 
Twitch founder Emmett Shearer is going to be our CEO, and they don't say interim. And Shearer then makes his own announcement. The board did not remove Sam over any specific disagreement on safety. The reason was completely different from that, but he doesn't say what it was. I'm not crazy enough to take this job without board support for commercialization of our awesome models. So look what he says, safety, commercialization. Drawing a clear line that says we are commercializing, we just want safety first. And removing Sam wasn't about the disagreement on commercialization and safety. It was wholly different from that. But he doesn't say what it is. I'm not leaving any gaps here. I'm quoting this exactly. So what is it? People are saying, okay, so it's a communication breakdown that led to this an amazing explosion over the weekend? Well, Microsoft then announces. Uh, we've hired Altman and Brockman, and they're gonna lead a newly founded AI effort. We're already in partnership with OpenAI, so they're gonna lead this effort, and we look forward to continuing to work with OpenAI. After all, we got a huge investment in it, $13 billion, and we look forward to working with Emmett Shear as well. And um, Microsoft shares were up 3% in pre-market trading. Because it really looks like Microsoft got something of a win. They have an investment in OpenAI. They, own, they get a lot of the profits from it. They own up to 49% of it. And they're getting a lot of technical knowledge from it. And now they got the two guys that were over there are now working for Microsoft on an AI thing. So Microsoft, and by the way, it was also rumored that about five of the staff a scientist had already committed to go to Microsoft. So Microsoft is inheriting a core group from OpenAI to be led by Sam and Greg. So now what? Well, we're gonna get to the epitaph and lessons, but you know, the internet loves a good conspiracy. And before we get into unpacking the winners and losers, it just shows you how whack the internet can be. And it can be right, or it can be very wrong. But there was out there, um, stories were floating, they were hitting on tip TikTok and a lot of other places, but they were popping like popcorn. So it may have been one story going viral, being reposted, other people making different videos with the same information and sort of spreading the same misinformation. But, I'm, but there was so much of it that it bears just talking about how crazy it can be. Is this part of it? Who knows? Remember, all we're saying, he wasn't forthright. Was it forthright about the chip thing he wanted to go get built and how he was trying to get foreign investment? Maybe, but there were groups that said, listen, Sam needed data to train the algorithm. So he started working with D2. D2 was an army of Chinese hackers that uh, D2 stands for Double Dragon. And they had created a shell company based in Singapore called Whitefly. And that uh, company in Singapore had access to 10 times the data that even Google has access to, to scrape and learn for algorithms. Algorithms and chat GPT and everything, GPT 3.5, GPT 4, they need data sets so that they can learn and bring more intelligence into the system. So supposedly Altman made a deal with the holding company Whitefly to bring that data over here so that it could spin up the open AI algorithms learning that much more effectively because it was 10 times the data that they had access to. And supposedly, you know, China just had this summit in San Francisco. Supposedly, members of the delegation told Biden, hey, this deal is working with D2 in Singapore. That's what they're doing. Our guys have figured it out. You need to check into it. And the way this little conspiracy theory goes, the NSA gets involved, they suss it out, and they say, yeah, something was up. They reach out to OpenAI, the board freaks out, and the board fires Sam. So believe what you want. You know, there's, there's your internet conspiracy rumor spinning around, and then you've got them merely saying it was a broke, breakdown in communication, and um, Sam wasn't forthright. Well, was he not forthright about building other projects and a chip factory to compete with a chip company to compete with NVIDIA? Or was he not forthright about where he was getting key stacks of data to train his algorithms? Who knows? But the D2 double dragon thing hasn't been confirmed. There's no evidence out there. There's people that are saying, hey man, trust me, bro. You know, you owe me a coffee in the morning when all this comes out in a couple weeks and it's seen that this is absolutely true what happened. Well, who knows? 
So now, who are the winners and losers at the end of this? Regardless of what happened, Sam, Greg, a bunch of researchers are now at Microsoft, not at OpenAI anymore, and the weekend news cycle has come and gone, as ugly as it was. So regardless of whether conspiracy is true about getting data out of, out of a shell company in Singapore, or it was a breakdown in communication over time and the board said, we've had it, whatever it is, the winner that I see is Microsoft. They get a, a team and they are, continue the open AI relationship where they've got $13 billion of investment. And I think the winner is the AI competitors. There's about five of them out there that are competing and following fast. And if there's a rule in Silicon Valley that is true, it's this, is that the first mover usually is not the dominant winner. It's usually one that comes second or even third. MySpace, then Facebook. You think about Lycos in search. You think about Overture that was in search, uh, funded by an incubator that was out in um, uh, Los Angeles. But then you see Google emerges and they're the king of search. So there are many proxies and case studies over time to show you that the first mover in Silicon Valley isn't necessarily the, 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 the 500 pound, the 300 pound gorilla later on. So I think the competitors have won because they're basking in the drama and the interruption to the business of open AI. What they thought, the board thought, and Elia thought would be the removal of Sam is, the, is not only the removal of Sam, but they lose a lot of talent and they lost a lot of trust. So I think the loser is open AI. It exposed they had a dysfunctional board that was handled poorly. There wasn't a good announcement. It didn't appear to have a PR plan. There's a lack of trust on the market. Remember, supposedly they didn't even call Nadella at Microsoft to say, hey, you're three, you're 13 million, 13 billion dollars into this. Uh, we gotta let you know, we gotta let Sam go, and here's why. There was no discussion about that. So that's a dysfunctional board that just didn't know how to handle that and did it terrible. And as a result, they lose trust from the market. There's other investors that were behind Sam that now they've lost trust with and people that continue to this day now still be investors. And they lose Altman. Say what you will, but regardless of the issues that led to the firing, he is still Sam Altman. And he is an incredibly bright guy, one of the geniuses of Silicon Valley, driving things forward. So I think they are definitely the loser in this, with the winners being the competition and something of a winner being Microsoft. They got upset, they weighed in, and at the end of the day, rather than him being instated, they now have a brand new AI initiative led by experts, and they still have their investment in open AI. So what are the lessons for you and me? Look, if you have a small company and you have a board, and I've had many of those, I've had two people on a board, I've had nine people on a board, you gotta communicate clearly, and do it monthly, not quarterly, and have at least one confidant on the board. Not someone that's against the board, but one person on the board that you can bounce ideas off of without the whole board weighing in. You need them to know, but when you say, hey, I got a couple ideas, I'd like to process them with you. If I'm crazy, I'm gonna ditch it and I won't bring anything up. But if I'm not crazy, let's bring it to the wider board for discussion. You need to have a confidant there. Every CEO needs a confidant to talk about certain things, not to hide them from the rest of the board. If it's something you wanna do and it's a big deal, it must be brought to the rest of your board, but have somebody you can talk to. And frequently you can't talk to your executive team. It may be too sensitive, maybe an acquisition, it may be something big on security. And so you need to have a confidant. Then when you fire a founder, that's dicey. And so if you're ever in a situation where they're gonna uh, fire you like Uber had with Travis Kalanick, you don't let it get to that because you see what Travis had, what was going on with the old boys club and things. I won't rehash all that, but you can look up the stories. And I think some of them are probably overplayed and some of them are probably very true and Travis was responsible for that. And at the end, he, he lost his job. But firing a founder is incredibly dicey, incredibly dicey and not to be taken lightly. But for you and me, we can work with our investors and we can work with our founders and we should do so with as much transparency and forthright as possible. Have yourself a confidant on the way and I think great things can happen for you and your company. And that, my friend, is a lesson for you and me. Now I told you I would add something about governance. So let's take a look at this. 
real quick. These were the nine seats of governance that was on the board. Because people say, well, if Sam had allies on the board, how the hell did this happen? Well, here's the nine seats over there. There was Sam, Greg, Adam D'Angelo, former from face, uh, founder of Quora, and he used to be at Facebook, Tasha McCauley, who was a scientist at RAN, Helen Toner, already talked about her. He says, Elia, the co-founder of OpenAI, Reid Hoffman, um, founder of LinkedIn, um, Siobhan Zillis, um, executive at Neuralink, you know, the chip implant for your brain that Elon Musk working on, and then Will Hurd, you know, who apparently left to work on a presidential campaign. So at the time they were going to go talk about removing Sam, look at this. Reed, Siobhan, and Will had left the board during 2023 for some reasons, and none of them were dramatic. They were just off to do other things. And then when these four get together, it's four people on the boat voting to remove Greg from the board. Now the board's down to five, and you say we're firing Sam. That is poor governance because these people should have been replaced. And if you were Sam, you should have replaced them with people that, that, that you knew and maybe one of them was one of your confidant. So when this happens, the confidant can say, hey, look, I get together with Sam. I talk to him. You know, we have a confidential relationship. Nothing that should be at the board doesn't get here eventually, if, it, if that's necessary. But you get somebody to kind of talk some sense into them, maybe about the way it's happened. But this shows you that's how the board became so small that, a, that Elia could then work with basically three other board members, starting with Helen, and have everything he needs to remove Sam from the board and to move forward. And maybe it was something big. Maybe this crazy conspiracy theory is something true about it, and Sam wasn't forthright about that. Who knows? However it goes, Sam is now running an AI group up at Microsoft, and OpenAI AI is running for cover, trying to restore trust of their major users and what will be their future board, their new CEO, who says he believes it all, but you know he's got to be coming in at least 1% skepticism. If he's 100% not skeptical, you know, he's, he's not being forthright with you. But that's where it's at. So there's the second lesson for us about board governance and what happened. And that, my friends, is the history, the weekend from hell, and the winners and losers and go forward of OpenAI. I hope that was helpful to you. I tried to pack a lot in a long verbal dialogue here, but I hope you can rewind it, read the slides, and apply it in your own life, and maybe it makes all of these articles that were popping like popcorn over the weekend, but they were incomplete. Hopefully I've been able to pull it all together, give you a little backstory and understanding, because ChatGPT is a good product, AI is here to stay, we're all gonna be using it at our businesses, and that's not gonna change, but this, was a pretty bloody saga of this chapter in the life of AI. What's up? I am back. I love my board and I love bringing you the facts, figures, and things that you can use. And I hope that breakdown of open AI, winners, losers, and things is really instructive for you. It's instructive for me just going through it. And it reminds me of how disciplines, clear communication, transparency is always the best policy. Anyway, if you like that case study, please subscribe and hit the bell so you get notifications when we're putting case studies up here. We usually do them on Mondays and Fridays between the podcast and the case study. And if you like that, maybe you like these, click on them from the BizDoc archive. As I like to say, I'm Tom Ellsworth with the BizDoc, and until next time, I hope I left you better than I found you.